Welcome to On My Way to Wealth, the podcast where busy Gen Xers can learn financial tips as they navigate life on their way to wealth. And now, please join your host, Luis Rosa. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of On My Way to Wealth. My name is Luis, and I'm your host. Today, I have a very special person in my life. She's a dear friend of mine. I've known her since I was in college. Her name is Juani. She's a registered nurse with over a decade of experience in the field of fertility. Currently working at Generation Next Fertility in New York City. She has extensive experience understanding all aspects of the patient's process. So we're going to pick her brain today about what people go through in terms of the process, fees, costs, things to expect, and things of that sort. So without further ado, welcome, Juani. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Louis. It is a pleasure. I'm so excited because I know I'm going to learn so much in this episode. So I can't wait for it to be available to the general public. Amazing. Great. I'm excited to be here and just share some of the information I have. That is awesome. I can't wait. So yeah, let's dive right in. So I wanted to ask you, uh, what are some different avenues that one can take when trying to conceive? Well, so when trying to conceive, of course, there's the good old fashioned way. But, you know, more and more as uh, millennials primarily are delaying parenthood, we're finding that's not always going to be, you know, the plan. And so um, a lot of people do resort to um, timed intercourse, which is, you know, they think they, they know what they're doing, but maybe they don't have the timing just right. So they come into the doctor's office and they're monitored. We tell them when they're ovulating and then when to go home and try. Other people need a little bit more intervention. And so then um, we may try intrauterine insemination or IUI. And that is when we time their ovulation, prepare the partner's sperm or donor sperm, if that's their choice, and um, inseminate it into the woman, put it into the uterus at the time where um, she's most fertile. And then there are other options such as IVF. And IVF can go with different routes. Um, It may be trying the in vitro fertilization with their own eggs or um, with maybe even a an egg donor. So IVF is basically extracting the eggs from the female and putting it together with sperm in the lab using different techniques, growing the embryo in the lab, and then transferring it back to the uterus at the time that it's most suited for implantation. Gotcha. All right. So it sounds like there are various reasons why someone would come to you, for example. So can you tell us just some of the, the more common reasons that you see where somebody, is it like they just don't want to have a baby right now or they can't? That's a great question because we don't, we just assume that people are infertile and there are different um, reasons why. So some of the primary reasons can be tubal factor. So the woman may have her fallopian tubes blocked and that means that there's essentially a mechanical issue. It's difficult for the sperm and the egg to meet. Um, And so the fertilization process has to take place outside the body. Um, It may be that the partner has a sperm that's not as ideal. So low count or low low morphology, low motility. Um, So there could be a male factor. Age is the major reason. Um, And so in more advanced age, there are difficulties with getting not just uh, enough eggs, but getting the right egg, the healthiest egg to fertilize. Um, And so those are some of the leading reasons um, to attempt fertility. And then there are people who are just not ready. um, And so they come in to preserve their fertility for the future. So freeze eggs or freeze sperm for down the line. Okay, got it. So can you tell us a little bit about that, like uh, elective versus medical? Yeah, so um, some people are not ready to have kids uh, right away, but they're focusing on their careers. Millennials right now are delaying parenthood uh, at record times just because, you know, we're focusing on careers and we're focusing on managing our finances, being better prepared so that we can down the road have a better quality of life with our children. And so because we're trying to kind of, you know, check all the boxes, we are delaying parenthood. So some people are choosing to freeze their eggs so that when they're ready, they can do so. So previously, women were freezing their eggs um, and it was considered experimental. Just a couple of years ago, they lifted that label. And so now it's considered medical and commercially available. Um, And so we're seeing more and more women choosing to freeze their eggs so that they are able to have a baby when they're ready, be it when their careers are settled or when they find the right partner. 
So that's elective or social egg freezing. So it's choosing to delay getting pregnant. Medical reasons to freeze your eggs could be due to a medical reason, as in the name, which usually is related to a diagnosis that requires treatment prior to trying to conceive. For example, cancer. Um, women who are trying to con- who are diagnosed with cancer may have to freeze their eggs in advance of having treatments such as chemotherapy or radiation so that those eggs are preserved and they're healthy and they're not impacted by the cancer treatment. Gotcha. Wow, that is so interesting. You know, you mentioned something that people usually hear the word fertility and just assume that you just have problems conceiving. And, you know, I must admit that I, I probably felt <laughs> under that category because I just didn't realize, like, you just taught me something about, yeah, maybe like a cancer treatment that might impact later. So you might want to plan ahead. And I mean, that's amazing. It's just something that would have never crossed my mind. Yeah. Right now I'm working with someone who is 38 years old. She came to us for a consultation, wanting to just freeze her eggs because she hasn't found the right partner and she's, you know, developing her career just a little further. We did a physical exam. The doctor noticed a little lump, sent her to go get a mammogram. Boom, there's a diagnosis, unfortunately. Fortunately, we caught it on time. It's stage one breast cancer. And so she's just doing a couple of rounds of egg freezing to make sure that her fertility is preserved so that once she's done with chemo and radiation, she can move forward with either trying to conceive carrying the pregnancy herself if she's cleared by her oncologist or using a gestational carrier in the future. But it's someone that wasn't trying to get pregnant, wasn't ready to have a baby. She just came in to know what her options were based on her ovarian reserve. The doctor recommended, yes, you're at the right age and it's the right time. Let's go for it. But now we've switched over from elective or social to medical. Nonetheless, she's very grateful that she was proactive about her fertility and came in in the first place. Yeah. Wow, that is amazing. That that is amazing. Well, I'm glad that you guys caught it on time in her case. And and tell me a little bit about when does sperm freezing come into play? Usually do couples have to decide, like, do we freeze eggs versus sperm? Do we do both? You know, the race against time historically has been for the eggs. For years, we've focused on the woman being the one. And that's because, you know, you hear about these guys that father pregnancies in their 50s and 60s and sometimes even 70s. Um, So we've focused primarily on women, but more and more we're starting to realize that men too um, can have a quality and quantity of sperm decline with age. So we are starting to see that pick up a little bit where men are choosing to freeze their sperm um, just so that it's there for the future. Not, Not as popular as egg freezing, but it is becoming available. And then there are medical reasons. So if there is a testicular cancer diagnosis or if there's any kind of cancer, really, um, and the guy's going to have to undergo chemo or radiation, sometimes even renal problems where someone may need a kidney transplant Mm. and they're going to be on long-term steroids. We're seeing more and more sperm freezing there. Um, And then because it's becoming a little bit more widely accessible medically with insurance coverage and such, we are starting to see people get more educated and wanting to be proactive. So the guys are starting to get involved finally. Gotcha. You know, my father's one of those. He had me when he was 50. (laughs) I know. And so and so it's really easy to say, well, you know, if dad did it, then why not? I can take my time. And and you hear about all these old timers doing it. But the reality is that we're learning more and more about the about the effects of, you know, delayed parenthood for men as well. So fortunately we get to we get to share the blame a little bit now. Gotcha. <laughs> well, and you mentioned both insurance and cost. So I wanted to go back to that because that brings me right back to my next question. So typically like what would it cost? I know it varies by person, but to like freeze eggs, for example, is that like a super expensive process? You know, it it really can be, unfortunately. Um, So a typical egg freezing cycle ranges depending on the facility and the state. You know, I'm in New York, and so it's one of the more expensive states uh, right there up there with California. Um, An egg freezing cycle will cost anywhere between six and twelve thousand dollars. And that's just one round. Now, in an ideal setting, the woman does one round and all her eggs are there. and, And so she's good to go. Unfortunately, it usually takes more than that. And so we are starting to work to reduce the overall cost 
so that women have the opportunity to do more than one cycle. Um, but that's that's the standard range um, across the country, six to 12,000 for egg freezing. Got it. And do you typically see either employers or insurance companies covering some of this or is it mostly an out-of-pocket expense for the individuals? You know, I'm, I'm dating myself. Uh, when I started doing <laughs> this, it was absolutely not covered, but we're starting to see a, ch- a shift in that. So a couple of the social media companies started this trend. And so more and more other companies are catching up where there is insurance coverage for elective egg freezing. For medical um, reasons, there are uh, over 10 states in the country that have mandatory coverage. Elective, it's more company-based. And so we are seeing companies such as Facebook and Google and you know uh, some of the others like Uber and Pinterest, where they're starting to catch up with that and they are offering that as a covered benefit. New York State just passed a mandate that's going to have coverage available. Egg freezing is not tied into that yet, um, but we're getting there. We're making progress. But overall, it is a cash um, expense, which is why we're learning how to reduce the cost for the patient. So whereas in the beginning, it was more in the ten to $12,000 range, some companies, some facility centers are finding ways to make it more cost-effective and accessible. And so we're getting the prices down. Very interesting. How does that impact same-sex couples who want children? Does insurance make it harder as a result because like, it's not medical? Like, is that then would fall under elective? Absolutely. So most insurances, not all, but most insurances do require justification for coverage of treatment or prior authorization is the proper term. And so in order to authorize the treatment and deem things medically necessary, we have to provide proof that the person has some form of infertility. So they're definitely, you know, out when it comes to egg freezing unless they work for one of the bigger companies. But as far as um, actually trying to conceive, they usually do have to provide evidence of having failed treatments or failed attempts. And so the the guideline is 12 months of success of unsuccessful trying. Now, in a in the case of a same sex female couple, she's not being exposed to sperm 12 times a year. She's not being exposed to sperm probably once a year, so she can't provide that evidence. And so, what we see is a lot of same sex couples that do have to go out of pocket initially and pay for treatments in order to hopefully get pregnant and be done, but otherwise spend the time, the energy, and the money to go through the treatments. And if unsuccessful, only then will their insurance kick in. Wow. Yeah, that sounds like quite the ordeal. Yeah, yeah. Man, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, Yeah, I'm learning so much here. I wanted to ask you too, like, let's say somebody's considering going into this process. What are like the top three to five questions that you suggest that people ask either their employer or their insurance company before they get started? Yeah, so that's a great question because um, even within the doctor's office, sometimes we ask a question and you you have to know how to ask it and hopefully get the right person on the other end of the call. Um, So asking, do I have fertility benefits to begin with? Is that coverage uh, just for diagnostics or is there actual coverage for treatment? Um, Because there are two types of coverage. Diagnostics is the insurance will pay to tell you what's wrong, but they won't pay for the treatment. So they'll do all the workup, they'll pay for all the testing, but they then the solution, you now you're out of you're you're out of pocket on that. So is it diagnostic or is it treatment coverage? And then with the treatments, um, is it a dollar amount coverage? So some insurance companies have a cap, whether it's 10, 15, 20. We're getting more progressive now with forty thousand dollars worth of coverage. So is it a dollar amount? And if it is a dollar amount, are the medications coming out of that dollar amount? And I'll touch on medications separately in a minute. But if the medications are coming out of that, it's really important for the person to know how they are going to distribute those funds. If it's not a dollar amount and it's a per treatment coverage, then how many cycles can they do? How many full treatment cycles? Are there requirements before getting uh, certain treatments covered? What is the justification that they need to provide to get that coverage? So for example... There's nothing evidently wrong with someone. So we need to take it one step further than trying naturally at home. Well, depending on their age, they may have to try three inseminations in the doctor's office or six inseminations before IVF is paid for. Other things to ask are, is there an age limitation? So some insurances do cut off at 
44, meaning I could have started my treatment today. And if I turn 44 tomorrow, treatment is no longer covered. So the the age limitation is very important. Um, and then other things to, to look into are the extras. So they'll say we'll pay for fertility, you know, we'll pay for IVF, for example, but all of the little extras, all the nuances, the special techniques to get the eggs to fertilize. If they have excess embryos, the freezing of the embryos, is that covered? Other uh, laboratory techniques such as assisted hatching, which is a laser technique to improve implantation, all of those things, because those are that's more like a going in a la carte. And so sometimes if that's not covered, now it's a difference of, okay, well, they'll pay for the treatment overall, but this is an extra 1500 here, 2000 there. And for some people, if they can't afford it, they may, you know, say, well, I'll forego that process, but that may be the deciding factor in their success. And because the coverage is not there, they may not do that. So it's important to ask your doctor for a list of all of the services that they anticipate you will need and call with that list in front of you. And and yeah, it's okay to be a little annoying and say, you know, is this covered? How many times is it covered? Um, you know, all of those details. And then regarding the medications. So medications out of pocket, depending on the treatment protocol, vary significantly. Um, and so it could be as little as, you know, $1,500, but in very aggressive protocols, it can get up there to, you know, five, six thousand dollars $6,000. Yeah. And so that's in addition to that, you know, six to $12,000 range for egg freezing. And if we're talking about IVF, now we're talking more about eight to $12,000. So you have to factor that in. And so that is something that if it is not covered from the insurance and people have to prepare for financially, um, if it is covered by insurance, then is it coming out of that max dollar amount? Really important because the insurance typically will mandate patients to use a specific pharmacy. That pharmacy is contracted to bill at a certain rate. And so where a cash order for $3,500 at the pharmacy, you know, I can go and just pay for that and the pharmacy will give me a discounted rate because I'm paying cash. If I go through my insurance's mail order pharmacy, that same order of drugs could easily be billed at seven or eight thousand dollars. So it's eating a bigger chunk of that coverage, right? So if all I have is ten thousand dollars for treatment and I consume seven thousand on meds, well now all I have is three thousand dollars left for coverage. So it's really important to differentiate the two so that you can distribute your funds much better. And we'd all love to say that it's going to be successful on the first try. And so, yeah, let me just use the insurance and, and get it all, you know, in there and not go out of pocket, but having a very realistic conversation with the doctor about what the chances of success are is really important so that you can get more for your money when it comes to insurance coverage. Right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And that example you gave, you'll be short a tremendous amount. It's like, <laughs> exactly. Most exactly. of it consumed by the meds. That's unbelievable. So I can't believe, well, I could believe that there are so many limitations set by the insurance <laughs> companies. Oh, absolutely. I'm not surprised at all. Uh, so let me ask you this. What are some, uh, are there any resources out there that people can use to help educate themselves? Any foundations, websites, anything like that that you recommend? Absolutely. So Resolve is the uh, national nonprofit organization, and that's a great resource to resort to as far as finding information about treatment and just details about how to deal with the process from a psychosocial, emotional perspective. ASRM, um, American Society for Reproductive Medicine, that's our governing body, if you will. They set all of our guidelines. And so they have a great website called reproductivefacts.org and it's patient-based and it's all one pagers of just quick ways to look up, you know, a procedure that you're having and you want more details about the expectations or, you know, how do I know what treatment options are available to me based on age? So it's one pagers, really easy reads, designed specifically for patients. Another great resource is SART, 
SART.org. And SART is the uh, Society for Assistive Reproductive Technologies, and they basically manage all of the statistics for the country. So different facilities report their numbers there. We all report to the Center for Disease Control as well, um, but we report our statistics there so that you can see based on, you know, it's really cool map. You just look at the geography of where you'd like to go and see the statistics for that particular center. Keep in mind, if a center is fairly new, they'll have, you know, very little data available, whereas centers that have been along, around a long time, they'll have more information. But it's, it's a great tool to use when deciding, you know, based on age, because some centers do specialize in women of more advanced age. Um, so if you're in the over 40 crowd, it's really important to look for a center that, that has data on that. Whereas other centers, they do focus on the younger population, more that like 25 to 35 population. And so, you know, the treatment protocols are going to be a little bit different. So you want to know that they have stats for your age group. Got it. Okay, great. And I'm, I'm going to put all those websites that Juan mentioned in the reference section of the show notes. So be sure to check those out as well. Wow, that's such a wealth of information. And I'm sure we could probably talk about this for hours. Absolutely. This is, yeah, this has been such a great wealth of knowledge that you've shared. Thank you so much. Wanted to ask you one last question then. So, and it probably includes some of the answers you were already given, but let's say someone is considering going through this process. What do you recommend, like, as far as like, where do they begin? What should be like the first thing they should either do, the first call they should make, et cetera? So assess your individual situation. If it's someone that's looking into egg freezing where they're not ready and they want to just figure out their options, typically you can go to the GYN and just say, hey, I want to have my blood test drawn to assess my ovarian reserve. And that test is called AMH, anti-malarian hormone. The downside to doing that through the GYN is that the GYN may not be equipped to answer all of those questions. Um, but with insurance coverage uh, being accessible more and more, you can certainly schedule a consultation with a reproductive endocrinologist. That's the kind of doctor that would treat you if you are going to pursue any kind of treatment. And just go in for some workup, a conversation, and have that test drawn. If it's um, someone who is trying to conceive, go straight to the reproductive endocrinologist. Start off by having a consultation. The doctor is going to take your history, do typically a physical exam, an ultrasound to evaluate the ovaries, draw some blood tests, AMH being one of them, um, and then other hormones that could be interfering based on the conversation of what's going on. Are your menstrual cycles regular? How often is it that you're trying? Depending on the circumstances, the partner will typically, if there's a partner involved, will um, also have a semen analysis so that we can put together a picture of what it is that's going on and then deciding the next steps. As that's all happening, once you know what the recommendations for treatment are, if any, then contacting the insurance company. Most doctors will verify the insurance and find out what your coverage is. I made you know note of getting the right person on the other line. Call yourself, ask those questions so that you have two reference points for coverage so that you know, you're sure that you have all of the information about coverage. And then, you know, have a conversation with yourself and with a partner if there's a partner and decide what the best timing is now it. Some people can't jump right into treatment. If there's no coverage, they do have to prepare financially. You know, we hear stories of people selling a condo, refinancing their home, parents getting involved and, and, you know, lending them some money or taking out loans. There are companies that are specific for fertility now. So it's not just going to your bank and taking out a loan. There are companies that work specifically with fertility centers and will provide you a loan at a slightly lower APR than you would get through your bank for treatment coverage. And they will, you know, kind of bundle the cost of the whole treatment and pay the doctor, pay the pharmacy, so that then you have just one monthly payment. So gathering all that data shopping around. It's, it's not a bad thing. I love spreadsheets. Everyone, you know, just kind of like list out all the services and compare. And the last thing is making sure that you connect with your doctor because you have to feel comfortable when you're spending this much time and money and energy. There's so many emotions involved. You have to feel that you're at the right place. And so if you don't feel that connection, if you don't feel like this is the right place for you, shop around a little bit. 
schedule a couple of consults if you don't feel like you connected with the with the first doctor you saw and with the team. Sometimes the doctor's great and maybe the team's not so great. Mm, so point. really see what the commission. Yeah, see what the communication is like even before walking in the door. How responsive are they? Do you have information about your insurance even before walking in? One of the things that my sensor does is that we verify their benefits prior to them coming in so they can have this information so that they're just better equipped. When you have the consultation, it's just a hurricane of information. From the medical perspective, getting hit with bad news about insurance is really rough. So we prepare them in advance and let them know what their coverage is like so that when they walk in the door, you know, it's just, it's one less thing to stress about. We still review that information in person, but we give them all of that in advance. And that way, from a financial perspective, they're a little bit more mentally equipped. And then I honestly believe in being vocal, talking to people, letting them know, not everybody, you know, this is a very private matter. Not everyone wants to talk about it, but finding support and resources. Everyone who's gone through this learns a little. And so in sharing your experiences, you learn from other people. And so different um, people learn about pharmacies that may have better pricing if you're going out of pocket. And discounts that might be available. There are discount programs to apply for savings on the medications from the pharmaceutical company. Sometimes the doctor's office is busy and, you know, they're just giving you all the data and and you run out. Talking to people so that you know what other options there are out there um, is really important. I sometimes hear stories about, and I by no means I'm promoting this as a nurse. Um, This is more from just, you know, having the best interest of patients at heart. Sometimes somebody has full coverage, They got their medications. They were successful the first time around, which is beautiful and amazing. We love those stories. And they have a little bit of medications left and they donate it to their friend. Um, And that always, yeah, that always touches my heart just because, you know, it's, it's being selfless with what doesn't seem like a big deal, but sometimes it's a, you know, a day of medications can cost $300. That's three hundred dollars dollars less that this person had to think about. So you know, being a little bit vocal and just knowing who's in your circle and and who might also be going through a similar experience doesn't hurt. So that maybe there's a little bit more help out there because that person might have spent a little bit more time in the situation and done some more research. Gotcha. Wow, that is amazing. I'm glad there are so many resources that people can lean on because I know, like you said, it's definitely an emotional decision and not just financial. So you got to prepare yourself both ways. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of time, I know that let's say somebody isn't ready and they plan on, let's say, freezing eggs, for example, is there a time limit kind of like that from the point that you do it successfully up until when you can use that particular eggs and stuff? There's no uh, specific time limit um, just yet. And so Although these are cells and and technology is evolving, and so we know what we know thus far, and and it could change in the future. Um, and I've seen the change in in the last 13 years from the different uh, freezing techniques that have been available. Right now, we do believe that you can freeze eggs long term. Um, and so what we're seeing is where most women came in and froze their eggs in their late 30s or early 40s. We're seeing more of the younger population coming in at 32, 34, freezing their eggs because they're not ready. They don't think that they're going to use them till 40 or 42 because a doctor, for example, they've just finished getting their career settled at that age, you know, establishing a practice and so forth. So there is no real expiration date. You can put it off a little bit. We're starting to see more and more parents uh, and grandparents giving this as graduation gifts, for example, for wow. egg freezing. That's interesting. Yeah. Which is, it's, it's really interesting. You know, I, I met a girl and so it was just really funny because the mom was like, yeah, I just want to make sure I'm going to have grandbabies one day. <laughs> so she was willing to, you know, to fork out the cash because this is a young person. She doesn't even have a, a you know, a, a career where she has great health insurance. So the mom was paying for the treatment to secure this option for her. I also met with a couple recently, both physicians. They are, you know, fresh out of school and they're starting to practice, but they're building their careers. And so they they need another three to five years. So these are young professionals. They're in a stable relationship. They know that they want to have babies with each other, but they're not ready yet. And so they're freezing embryos. So they're going through the whole in vitro process, creating the embryos and freezing them for the future. And so in another couple of years, when they're ready, she'll just have to undergo the frozen embryo transfer, which is amazing. And so 
not, there's not a set deadline. It's important to know that it's not a sure thing. Thawing um, eggs and embryos is not 100%, although success rates for thawing embryos are nice and high and eggs are, are also progressing. There's, it's a different type of cell, so they're not exactly the same when they thaw, but nonetheless, the technology is getting better and better. But as far as having that there, it is a great backup plan. And some people freeze and they may, when they decide they're ready, try on their own first. But if it's not successful on their own, then that's there. And I've dealt with situations like that where I worked with a young woman years ago now. She froze her eggs at 32, met her partner at 35, started trying, tried for a year, got pregnant at 36, had her baby. When she tried for baby number two, that's when it got hard. But those eggs were there from 32. And so her chances at that age were that of the 32-year-old version of herself, not her current age. So that's also something that we see. That is amazing. Then I have what might come across as a really stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. No, no such thing. <laughs> Where are these things kept? <laughs> okay. So they are frozen with liquid nitrogen. And so they are stored in your doctor's office typically. So we have the space available. So they're kept in these. So they're frozen in little vials and the vials are kept in what we call a cane. And the cane is in a big tank and it does look like something out of a movie. And so these tanks are kept typically in the doctor's office, although there are facilities that focus just on long-term storage. But most people do keep it with their doctor so that they're not transporting them back and forth. Most facilities have them in a secure location with limited access. So you can't just kind of walk around and see the tanks everywhere. They're not everywhere. They're usually in a room that's locked with limited access by employees. They're kept on monitors. They're kept with surveillance so that we can be sure that those tanks are maintained and full. They're on backup batteries usually so that if ever there's a power outage, which we've learned in New York now happens more, more than we would like to admit. Um, and so they're kept on backup power so that all of the security and surveillance and all of the measures that are in place will work in the event of any emergencies. Gotcha. Wow. Sounds like a, you know, the movie Casino over here. <laughs> <On surveillance. laughs> a little bit, a little bit. That gives me uh, a lot of... Uh, ease, you know, knowing that it's it's that safe. It's not like it's stored, you know, at, at the pantry and where people put their lunch in. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, no, no. It's not kept left next to the peas or anything like that. <laughs> wow. Well, well, thank you so much, Juani. I know I kept you here longer than we originally scheduled for. No worries. I seem to do when the topic is really engaging and, and, you know, time just flies when you're having fun, they say. So this was definitely one of those. So thank you so much for sharing all the information. Thank and your you time for today. having me. And uh, I'll be sure to put uh, your company website and all the resources that you listed in the show notes. So everyone, thank you for listening. Uh, again, this is just for educational purposes only, not to be considered medical advice. Make sure to consult with your own medical team and your doctors before you make any decision for yourself. And thank you so much, Ronnie. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to On My Way to Wealth. If you have any questions, we'd love to hear from you. Send Luis an email at luis at onmywaytowealth.com. To read the show notes and the blog, please visit www.onmywaytowealth.com. Luis Rosa is an investment advisor representative of Retirement Wealth Advisors, Inc., an SEC registered investment advisor. Build a better financial future and Retirement Wealth Advisors are not affiliated. Exposure to ideas and financial vehicles discussed should not be considered investment advice or recommendation to buy or sell any financial vehicle. This information should not be considered tax or legal advice. Individuals should consult with the professionals specializing in the fields of tax, legal, accounting, or investments regarding the applicability of this information for their situation. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Investments will fluctuate and when redeemed, may be worth more or less than when originally invested.